essentially every other day the professor went to the board and did some different ingenious calculation which led to the exact same result. I got so bored and tired of it until like three years later I realized how brilliant he was being. Um, so the idea that we're going to do is an idea of, um, of the calculus of variations, which is a way of thinking about functions which is probably new to um, essentially all of you. So let's just sort of launch in. And I want you to, to be thinking about this a lot. Uh, this should be relatively confusing. Um, Let's start off by having some function f, which depends on two things. The slots that the two things that f depend on, I'm calling y and y prime. y here means y of x, some function. And y prime means dy dx. So for example, this function f that I'm thinking of might be 3y minus y prime over y. That's my function f. <coughs> OK? That makes sense? Depends on y and y prime. Is that an i after? This is a semicolon. Oh. That's a comma, and that's a semicolon. I'm going to explain now what that semicolon means. Okay. F, which I, when I wrote it this way, looks like it depends on Y and Y prime. And I'm now telling you that Y is a function of X, and so Y prime means it's derivative. So in a sense, F ultimately depends on X. Possibly. Because it, F depends on Y, and Y depends on X. And f depends on y prime, and y prime depends on x. So ultimately, I give you a value of x, a value along the real line, and you compute the value of the function y, you compute the value of the function's derivative y prime. You take those two numbers, you stick them into f, and then you've got a value for f. Does that make sense? So this notation means, this notation here means f explicitly depends on y and y prime. And it implicitly depends on x. Okay? So when I write f down, I don't see any x's. I only see y's and y primes. I don't see any x's. The x's are buried inside of y of x. Okay, now there was a question. Yeah? So f is just the differential equation? Uh, no, f is just, well, f some. Um, it's not a differential equation. It would be a differential equation if I said equal to a number. If I said f is equal to 2, that would be a differential equation. Okay. But right now, what I'm going to call f is a functional. Okay? I'm going to call f a functional. A functional is a function that depends on functions. So a functional is a function whose domain is other functions. Now I've just said something tremendously complicated. Right? Let's take the function y is equal to x squared. The domain of the function y are all the values on the real line. Right? So I know what I mean by the domain of the function y is equal to x squared. It's any number I can think of that's a real number. If I wanted to, I could let it be any complex number. Complex numbers could be plugged into y is equal to x squared too. Right. But um, that function's domain wouldn't include a five-component vector. 
for example. All right, I wouldn't know how to, if V was some vector that had five different components, I wouldn't know how to stick it into Y is equal to X squared. So my functional F depends on functions Y. So if I give you a different function, y is equal to the sine of x minus x over 2, that would lead to a different f. And so the domain of f is the space of all differentiable functions. f depends on y, and f depends on the derivative of y. So y better have a derivative, it must be differentiable. So f depends on any function you can think of that you can take its derivative. Yep. Well, if I'm thinking of f as a function of y and y prime, the domain of f is that function and any other function I might think of. Now, once I pick a function, then I can pick a value of x, and I can get a number for f. But right now, f is this kind of general thing, and, and it's and it, any function I can think of that I can take as derivative can be plugged into f. See, that's f. 3y minus y prime over y. So any function I can think of, I can stick into there, so that's the domain of f. How big is the function space that of differentiable functions. Depends on the function. It's infinitely big. There are an infinite number of possible functions that I can write down that are differentiable that I could put into this equation. Those of you who have had quantum mechanics, has anybody had quantum mechanics yet? Okay, so you probably had it with Devaney, and Devaney would have harped all over the place about function space. Oh, yes. That is what we're talking about here. Okay, so those of you who have quantum mechanics next semester, um, we will harp ad nauseum on function space. Okay? And function space is the space of the where all the possible functions live. So an element of function space is a function. Okay? The real line, number line, an element of the number line is a particular number. 6.0289 is an element of the real the space, the real line. x squared is an element of function space. So is x squared plus 1. Okay, so I got this f thing, and f depends on y and y prime, and it kind of depends on x, but not explicitly. There aren't any x's there, which is what this semicolon notation means. And I take f and I integrate it between x1 and x2, and I call that j. j is also a function. If I change the function y, I get a different value for j. But j is an explicit number. Notice here that... <coughs> Once I pick a function y, I tell you what it is. I put it into f, I integrate it, and I get a number because I just did a definite integral. And the answer to doing a definite integral is a number. Right? So now there are, I'm free to do all sorts of things. I'm free to pick different f's. Here's one. This one has no physical meaning. It's not interesting at all. Okay? And I'm free to pick different functions y. But once I tell you what f is, I say this is the one I'm going to think about now. And I tell you a particular function y, and I put it in there, I put it in there, I do the interval, I get a number of j. Does this make sense? Yeah. So J is not a function of F is a function of J is sometimes also called a functional. Okay. 
because ultimately it depends on f. It depends on my choice of f, and it depends on my choice of y. So it's a functional too. It's kind of an uber function. Okay. Okay. So you said that that f has no physical Yeah, this one does. Yes, and in fact, we will do so. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's going to be the point, right? So there's this very generic thing that we're talking about, but now there are two or three <coughs> different choices that you can make here, for, and you would get something physical. For example, um, you can um, choose a function f, that when you integrate it tells you how far it is between two different places on a given surface. We'll do that example in a little bit. For instance, you can choose F to be the difference between the kinetic energy and the potential energy. You might choose it to be the sum. If you choose it to be the sum, you don't get anything that's interesting. But if you choose F to be the difference between the kinetic energy and the potential energy, then when you do what we're going to do next, you get out of the result of that something equivalent to Newton's second law. All right, so we have to see all this stuff play out. Yeah, so I might find, use it for finding the distance between two points on a surface. That's one application. Uh, I haven't gotten it yet. All right. So, um, a given, if I pick a y of x, it would tell me the distance along a given path between two points on a surface. And what this, what I'm going to do next will help me figure out which path is the shortest. All right. But so that's where I'm going. That's, that's, that's where I'm going next. All right. So that, that, that brings up what we um, want to think about here. So, I'm going to do something somewhat insane looking. So I have a vertical axis up here, which is the j-axis. And down here, I have an infinite dimensional function space, which I denoted by having many axes down in this direction. I only drew some of them. OK? So a point down here is maybe y equals x squared. And this point over here is y is the sine of x. And this point over here is y is equal to e to the x. Okay, so the different points down here are different functions that I might pick. When I pick a function, y of x, I stick it into this integral. I take its derivative, I stick it into the integral. And I get a number. So I could then plot the height, the value of j, for each one of these places. Does that make sense? So I have here in mind that I have some sort of surface up here. You know, here's my surface. These are the values of j given a particular choice of function. Pick x squared, j is equal to 3. I pick e to the x, j is equal to 5 million. I pick, you know, so if you know, I pick a function, I do this integral, I get a number. Feel good? So, like, we're not going to do f as all those together. It would just be like f of x squared, comma, 2x. Exactly. All right. And whatever f is. So, you know, if f was 3y minus y, so I would stick that in, I'd integrate that, I get a number. Doesn't j depend on the boundary conditions of that definite Yeah, it depends on x1 and x2. So if I choose different ones, it would be different Yeah, days. so it would shift, right? So if I choose different x1 and x2, the surface would shift. If I chose a different function f, the surface would shift. Right? But what I'm trying to represent here is that the domain is all the functions. And when I pick a function and put it into the integral, I get a number, and so I have a surface up here. And my surface might have a minimum, or maximum, might have a local extremum. 
In other words, there might be a place on this surface where the value of j is locally bigger than any other place or any other function, or locally smaller than any other function. So there might be a particular function that when you stick into this integral, you get negative 2. And any other function you choose is more, when you stick it in the integral, gives you more than negative 2. The negative 2 would be a minimum of this integral j. So our goal is to find local extrema in J. So as Y of X changes, find a Y of X that is a local min or max. That's what I'm trying to do. So now my goal is to find a way to pick the function y of x that makes j an extreme value. I'll say that slowly again because that's got to sort of sink in. The goal is to find the function, find a way to find the function. I want to have a rule which tells me how to find the function y of x such that j is either maximized or minimized when I vary that function a little bit. <coughs> so if I multiplied the function by 1.02 or subtracted 0.03 from it, we did something that made it slightly different from what it is now, it would make the value of j bigger or smaller than that minimum or maximum value. Okay. People okay with that? Fine. Uh, notation. So delta here is going to mean the variation. So I'm going to say delta of g means the variation in g. The variation just means how much does it change. It's not, not a deep idea. It's just how much does it change. If g is a function of x, the variation in g is defined to be the derivative of g with respect to x times the variation in x. It's kind of like the differential d. You can say that you know dg is, would be derivative of g with respect to x dx, but you use the sign variation because it's slightly technically different in some precise mathematical sense, which is important to what we're talking about. So this is the variation. Okay, folks, okay with that? It's the derivative of g with respect to x times delta x. Yeah. So. Uh, and if you think about what that means, I suppose you got some function here. Here's g of x, right? Delta x is some distance down here. Um, delta g is some distance over there. And there's some slope here. And the slope here is dg dx. And so the little tiny change in g is the slope of the function times the little tiny change in x, is what we're, what we're saying. Now the point here is that what we want to do is that we want to find a way to, to express the idea that the variation in j is 0. I want to find the extremal functions, the functions which make j a minimum or a maximum. How do I find a minimum or a maximum? 
everyone in the class says, you take the derivative and set it equal to zero. Right? Okay. So, I have to know how to write down the variation in J. Okay. Now this is a calculation you have to be able to do. So this is in the book, it's in the lecture notes. We're going to go through it again now. You're going to be required to do it on the test. Okay. So I take the variation of both sides. I have the variation of the interval. If the endpoints are fixed in a definite interval, you can always pass a derivative inside the integration. If the endpoints vary, then when you take the derivative of an integral with endpoints that vary, there's some rule that says that you evaluate the function at the derivative at the at some place and then multiply by the derivative of the endpoints. And then you can pass the thing inside. But if the endpoints are fixed, you can just slub the integral, the derivative right over the integration sign right inside the integral. In this case, our endpoints are going to be fixed. Okay, okay, okay. So the variation in J, I need to be able to compute the variation in F. So let me now start computing the variation in F. Delta of F, which depends on Y and Y prime, and then implicitly on X is the derivative of f with respect to y, delta y, plus the derivative of f with respect to y prime, delta y prime. So f depends on two things explicitly, y and y prime. So I've got to take two derivatives and multiply by the variation y and variation y prime. Now, this guy over here, is the variation of dy dx. Which is d by dx of the variation of y. Because variations are like derivatives and the order doesn't matter. So taking a variation of a derivative is the same thing as taking the derivative of a variation. The order there goes. Um, when we take the variation of f, yep. it's x is only implicitly dependent, That's f right. is only implicitly dependent on x, so we don't account for it. Right. And then when we look at the variance of y and the variance of y prime, why don't we break that up even further? So it'd be delta y over delta x times the variation of x. That's a good question. All right, so let me parse that into two parts. Okay. The first thing that you said was that I didn't have a term here that said df dx delta x. Okay? I don't have a term that says df dx because x isn't explicitly in there, so I'm not going to take a derivative of it. It's only in there through the y. Okay? The second part of what you said was a good observation that I've stopped at delta of y. I didn't go, well, y is a function of x. So delta of y ought to be dy dx delta of x. The reason for that is this. What I'm trying to do is to find the function y that makes j a minimum. So what I want to vary are my functions y. I'm going to stop at the point of varying y. Because what I want to do is, I don't want to, I don't, I'm not interested in the x values. What I'm interested in are the functions themselves. I want to find the function which makes this integral a minimum or maximum. So I'm stopping at the point where I'm varying with respect to y. 
because I'm going to try to pick a y that if I changed it a little bit, if I changed my function a little bit, would make j different <coughs> and not be the number. Does that make sense? Would it be wrong to do? I know it wouldn't help us here because we're looking at the y, the function of y. It wouldn't be formally wrong to do probably, but it's not the step that you do here. Okay. Because it doesn't meet our goal. Our goal is to find the variation in y. Our goal is to find something happening in y. Okay. Okay. So this term here, I'm going to work on a little bit. I'll point out to you that what I have now is that delta of j is the integral of x1 to x2 of the derivative of f with respect to y, delta y, plus the derivative of f with respect to y prime, d by dx of delta y, dx. Now, for reasons which are not clear to you at this point, I'm just going to tell you what I want to do. I want to factor variation of y outside of this parentheses. But I can't do that yet. Because here I have a variation of y. But in this term over here, I have the derivative of the variation of y. Okay? I don't want to have the derivative of the variation of y in this term. I just want to have a term over here that looks like the variation of y. So I'm going to perform the theoretical physicist's most useful trick. <laughs> Integration by parts. Oh, Someone listen to the lecture notes. <laughs> the, physicist, the theoretical physicist's most useful trick is to integrate by parts. Okay. Folks, remember integrating by parts? <laughs> A little. All right, so if I have the integral of u dv, that's equal to the integral, well, it's equal to v uv minus times u minus the integral of v du. Everybody knows how to drive that, right? Yeah, it's in the chain or product rule backwards. Yes, yeah, look, you know, if you take the integral of d of v u, that's the integral of v du plus the integral of u dv. Just rearrange it with my side. Follow along the same terms over the other side. That makes sense? Okay, so what do I have here? I have the integral of the derivative of f with respect to y prime d by dx of delta of y dx. Well, that's going to be equal to derivative of f with respect to y prime <coughs> delta of y minus the integral of delta of y times d by dx of the derivative of f with respect to y prime and one other or dx. Alright, so that's integrating by parts. And Let's go back to the game that we're playing here. Here is x1. Here is x2. Okay. 